Th uh, thank you, Eric. It's a pleasure to be here um, uh, uh, to um, have this conversation with you all, and especially a pleasure to be here to honor Ken uh, for his important contributions uh, to um, uh, an evidence-based approach to chaplaincy, which is what I'd like to talk with you about uh, this morning. So uh, this is a general outline of, of what I'd like to cover. Um, I, I, I want to talk with you a little bit uh, about where chaplaincy and chaplaincy research begins, um, and then um, spend a few minutes talking uh, about the developments that have occurred over the last 20 years um, uh, of developing uh, a research-informed approach to chaplaincy and the important role of research about religious coping in the development of that, um, and then um, uh, talk a little bit about um, where we're going to be going uh, in an evidence-based uh, approach, a research-informed approach to chaplaincy, and, uh, and then talk uh, a little bit about not only uh, Ken's intellectual contributions to this development, uh, but to also his personal contributions. I'm going to read uh, uh, some things for the first five minutes or so here in order to be sure I cover all the points that I want to cover. In the past 25 years, healthcare chaplains have embraced and attempted to develop a research informed approach to their profession. However, we're clearly in the early stages of developing evidence based chaplaincy. Ken Pargament's work and his personal interest and support have played a critical role in helping us get to this point and they'll continue to have an important influence in the future. When we think about modern chaplaincy, it kind of begins uh, in the middle of the 20th century. The two strongest theoretical influences uh, on healthcare chaplaincy in the 20th century were Freud's uh, uh, psych psychology and Rogers' uh, client-centered perspective on therapy. During this period, chaplains were observing the various ways that people were using religion and spirituality to cope with the stress of being ill but we had limited ability to describe what we saw and even more limited ability to investigate it. And additionally, the dominant, chaplaincy, the dominant chaplaincy intervention that emerged in that period, which is sometimes called being present with people, was nonspecific and it was hostile in some ways to the idea of outcome-oriented care. Ken's work on religious coping, particularly uh, uh, the book uh, on the psychology uh, of religious coping in 1997, provided a new and important conceptual framework for chaplain's spiritual care. Specifically, chaplains who were working with people, uh, chaplains work with people who use religion to cope with healthcare crises. But up until uh, we encountered Ken's work, uh, we had no theory really to help us to describe and reflect on the varieties of religious coping that we were observing and their implications for our care. I, in a recent research seminar with students in a year-long chaplaincy training program we call them residents, uh, one of the articles the students read was actually uh, an article by chaplain researcher Daniel Grossome, who's here. Um, and in that article, Daniel refers to um, uh, Ken's work on uh, describing the varieties of religious coping and m measuring religious coping with the R-COPE. And the student said, as you see here on the quote, I want to know more about this. <coughs> I see these different ways of coping all the time, and I've never had a way to describe them. And I think that's kind of what happened for chaplains in the 1990s as we began to encounter Ken's work on religious coping. In the 1990s, there were in chaplaincy a number of voices who said, research is important, we need to be doing more research uh, about our work, but we didn't advance it much. We just had kind of these general statements that it's a good thing to do and we ought to do some of it or more of it, um, but we really weren't able to move forward with it. But then Ken's work becomes available to us. We begin to recognize it and, and learn about it um, and it enables us, I think, to kind of move from this general commitment to religion being important for the work of chaplains to being able actually to move ahead 
and be specific about it. One of the first times that Ken's work is referred to, uh, the work about religious coping is referred to, was this article in 1993 by Larry Vandercreek and Art Lucas. Larry was really, uh, uh, in the later, latter part of the 20th century, um, one of the pioneers uh, in chaplaincy research. Uh, he was uh, first at Ohio State, and I think got to know Ken and some of uh, Ken's doctoral students here. And uh, in this article, they refer to the 1990 paper on, on God Help Me, uh, and you can see uh, uh, one of the statements they make uh, about the importance of learning more about religious coping uh, so that we can uh, build on that important work. Randy Creek goes on in uh, 1995, actually, to publish a collection of articles uh, about research about religion and spirituality and health um, uh, that would be relevant for chaplains to be aware of. Uh, and in that 1995 collection, he actually then includes a reprint uh, of Ken's 1990 paper. So more and more chaplains are beginning uh, to be aware uh, of that work. Our research program at Rush began in 1990. At that time, it was me working half-time in research, and I had no training in research. Um, but we had a lot of colleagues uh, at Rush, uh, particularly colleagues in psychology, um, who were uh, experienced and competent investigators. And there was um, some welcome uh, uh, to partner with them in research. And so all of the research that we began to do uh, was in conjunction uh, with research colleagues who had experience, could mentor uh, me, uh, and help uh, guide the research. One of the first projects that we did was this Fetzer-funded study about the role of religion uh, and spirituality in coping with illness and uh, a recovery from illness uh, in patients in our medical rehabilitation unit. And we were building on a small study that had been done at Northwestern in which there was a finding that Patients who had higher levels of religious involvement, who had hip replacement surgery, were walking further at the time of discharge. Uh, and so uh, Fetzer had a call for uh, studies about the role of religion, spirituality, and medical rehab. We received one of those studies, and we en enrolled approximately 100 patients um, and uh, gave them a bunch of measures of religion, spirituality. At baseline, we assumed that we would find uh, something similar to what they had found at Northwestern, and that was at discharge. The more religious patients had higher levels of functional ability, um, and, 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 and then um, we also called them a, f a few weeks after discharge to also ask questions about functional ability. And we found that actually higher levels of religious involvement, whether it was kind of uh, involvement in public uh, worship or private prayer or um, salience of religion or positive religious coping, none of them had any impact uh, on functional status for the patients after we adjusted for baseline factors and other things like that. It hadn't been an original part of our hypothesis, but we did include an early measure of religious struggle in the study, and it turned out that that was, in fact, the one factor that predicted adjustment over time uh, for these patients when we had kind of adjusted for the baseline factors. And you see here kind of a simple diagram of our findings, and, and that was that um, it, we just picked out this one item here with anger with God, but for the whole subscale, um, higher levels of religious struggle were associated with poor recovery of functional uh, uh, independence in the rehab patients. So this was 1999 uh, when we published this. Uh, there had not been a lot of findings like this in the literature. Some of the work that Ken and Harold Koenig did together hadn't begun to be published yet. <coughs> we thought this was kind of an anomaly. We put it in the report. We were kind of confused by it. I was a novice researcher, so I thought it might have been a mistake. Um, uh, um, but, you know, we just kind of um, um, took it at that. Soon after this, of course, there begin to be other findings that suggest that religious struggle is associated with uh, a number of poor outcomes. Um, and, and so we began to think, oh my word, there's something happening here that we need to pay attention to. <coughs> Soon after this, we uh, did a study um, I in which um, th the negative religious coping subscale of the brief R COPE was used uh, with diabetes outpatients and congestive heart failure, newly diagnosed congestive heart failure outpatients, um, and um, uh, a, s a, a group of oncology inpatients. <coughs> The outcome measures for each of the, the samples was slightly different, but you'll see that there's actually a consistent pattern 
uh, cross-sectional associations uh, of harmful associations uh, for quality of life uh, and emotional well-being uh, with negative religious coping. And so, um, you know, our own evidence and, and the evidence that was coming from uh, the work of Ken and Harold and others began to suggest to us that, in fact, you could measure religious need or religious distress or religious struggle in, in ways that I think chaplains 10 years earlier would not have imagined, could have been done, um, and that when you began to measure it, uh, you began to see actually that it's just kind of not innocuous actually it is a consistent pattern uh, of associations with poor outcomes for patients. Uh, and so that led us to the question, well, how common is this? Is this just kind of, y you know, a rare thing for a few patients? Or as chaplains, do we need to be more attentive to how often this is showing up? And so in that same sample, uh, you, you know, we just looked at the scores, and, and, and as you all know, there's kind of uh, a very skewed distribution. Half the patients score zero, uh, no evidence of religious struggle uh, on the, um, the negative religious coping subscale. <coughs> and then uh, about 30 percent of the patients with a very low uh, score uh, on negative religious struggle. And then something like 15 percent in this particular sample with moderate to high levels of religious struggle. So that began to suggest to us that it's not rare um, and that as chaplains uh, we need to be attentive uh, to um, not only its harmful effects but um, its prevalence um, and um, then begin to think about how do we find ways to identify the patients early in their hospital course who may be potentially experiencing religious struggle so that we can um, get to them as quickly as possible and, and learn more about that and see if we can be of assistance to them. So the more we began to learn about this and do work in this area, the more we began to think that um, um, focusing on um, religious distress, uh, religious struggle would help chaplains answer a number of questions that were important to them and important to their healthcare colleagues. So prior to this work, whenever uh, a chaplain was in a conversation with a healthcare manager about what kind of staffing levels were necessary um, as pastoral care, spiritual care staffing levels were necessary in a given clinical area, we always said as many as we can get uh, because we had no way to think about that. But this research then begins to allow us to think about acuity of spiritual distress or spiritual need in any given clinical population and allows us to begin to think about um, uh, what that means for responsible levels of, of chaplaincy staffing in order to be able to respond to the acuity of spiritual need in those populations. So these are four different studies in palliative care. They, uh, none of them are using uh, the negative religious coping subscale, um, but they um, are all in some sense kind of pursuing the same theme, a and that is to what extent is, is the measure of unmet spiritual need or spiritual distress or spiritual pain in palliative care patients that enables us to be more accurate about what proportion of patients in any cl given clinical area are likely to be having spiritual distress that requires chaplain's attention. So all of this research became very important to help us um, uh, answer that kind of question. Another thing that this research uh, enabled us to begin to do was actually work with our healthcare colleagues to think more systematically uh, and effectively about how they should identify patients um, who should be referred uh, to the chaplain for spiritual care. If any, in a hospital, if there was any um, kind of a consistent pattern uh, of staff um, inquiring of patients uh, about uh, um, spiritual need or spiritual concerns in a way that would inform making a referral to the chaplain, the most common method uh, was uh, the nurse uh, would say to the patient uh, around time of admission, would you like to see the chaplain? And we soon began to realize, actually, that uh, a number of the patients who said no to this were, in, in fact, patients who were experiencing religious or spiritual struggle for whom it was most important to make the referral to the chaplain. But once you'd asked the question and gotten the patient to say no, you really kind of had your hands tied in some complicated ways. And so the research led us to realize that we needed to find ways to think about how can you identify patients who are experiencing religious or spiritual struggle 
in simple enough ways kind of screening questions that you could give to uh, physicians and nurses, uh, psychologists, social workers, and other healthcare colleagues who could begin then to use that to screen uh, uh, for potential religious spiritual distress and make referrals to chaplains. And so that led us uh, at Rush to develop what is sometimes called the Rush uh, Religious uh, Struggle Screening Protocol in, in which um, they're kind of um, a series of branching questions where we begin by asking a patient is religion or spirit and so it this is designed to be used by non-chaplain healthcare colleagues to kind of identify patients in an inpatient or outpatient context who potentially need um, a referral to a chaplain for further assessment and potential spiritual care um, and so it begins by asking is religion or spirituality important to you for the patients who say yes then it kind of says to what extent are you getting the strength and comfort you need from religion spirituality the patient says all that I need we don't think that's a red flag for spiritual struggle but if the patient says well somewhat less than I need or none at all that we think is the first red flag for a potential religious spiritual struggle and there should be a referral to the chaplain the harder pathway is actually the other pathway uh, when you ask the patient is religion and spirituality important to you as you cope with your illness and they say no do you assume they're happy well-adjusted atheist and there's no need for a referral to the chaplain or is there a possibility that at some point religion or spirituality was important to them but something's happened that has caused uh, some alienation from religion and spirituality and there's some unresolved issues there that need uh, would benefit from spiritual care um, and so the way we thought about doing that was if they say no it's not important now we would just then simply ask was there ever a time when it was and so a patient who says no it's not important now yes it was important in the past we considered that the second red flag so uh, this the uh, protocol has been used in uh, a number of different situations uh, we originally developed it in the medical rehab unit at rush um, uh, it's been used um, uh, in uh, Seattle Cancer Care Alliance Stephen King our colleague uh, has uh, done some work with it uh, Daniel Grossome has done some work with it with um, the parents of children with cystic fibrosis recently he and his colleagues uh, have done some work with it uh, in a clinic at, at Cincinnati Children's Hospital and Medical Center that treats children uh, transgender children uh, and, and these are data um, from uh, an outpatient uh, cohort of older adults who uh, uh, reported symptoms of depression um, who are part of a kind of comprehensive um, uh, follow-up program for older adults with depression and you'll see about 50 percent of them screen positive uh, for potential religious spiritual struggle and uh, consistent with what we know from negative religious coping um, those who screen positive for religious struggle had these all of these patients were had elevated scores on depression and, and for those who screen positive on uh, potential religious spiritual struggle the scores are even higher um, and so that paper is under review right now so, but the point is that um, uh, all of the research about religious coping and, and uh, negative religious coping and religious spiritual struggle led us uh, to begin to be more focused on patients who may be experiencing that and and thinking of ways then uh, to identify how can we find those patients earlier um, so that chaplains could be referred to them uh, for spiritual care. We've recently done some work kind of trying to test the sensitivity and specificity of this protocol, uh, in, in that sense trying to test its validity, uh, and, and uh, again it was a sample from the um, uh, Seattle Cancer Care Alliance of long-term bone marrow transplant survivors, uh, and uh, the reference standard that we had was the negative religious coping subscale uh, of the brief arc cope itself. And the sensitivity uh, for this particular uh, screening protocol is only about 40%. So obviously we've got to do a better job, but uh, we've gotten on a pathway uh, of working on these things that hadn't been true before. All of this uh, has led some chaplains uh, to begin uh, to do additional research. Um, so this is a, a study, uh, it's actually the first randomized clinical trial of chaplain care. Uh, it was done with uh, 50 uh, uh, COPD patients uh, at a small community hospital in Roanoke, Virginia, um, uh, and um, not necessarily measuring religious or spiritual struggle or religious coping. They were actually measuring uh, the impact of chaplain care on anxiety compared to patients who didn't receive any chaplain visits. Uh, patients who did receive uh, chaplain visits on a daily basis had a steeper uh, decline in their anxiety scores during their hospitalization. They also actually had shorter length of stay uh, um, um, 
But part of what's important is this is actually one of two randomized clinical trials that have been done. Uh, the other was done by Paul Bay at, at IU Health in, in Indianapolis. Uh, in which Paul worked with patients receiving heart surgery, um, and um, one group was randomized to, uh, to no chaplain visits, uh, the other group was randomized to a certain number of chaplain visits. And Paul, unlike this study, actually didn't find any significant uh, effect of chaplain care on anxiety or depression. He did find that actually at six month follow up, um, patients who had chaplain visits had lower scores on negative religious coping and higher scores on positive religious coping. But part of what we began to realize is that the re potential reason why there was no effect of chaplain care on the main outcomes of anxiety and depression was that, in general, patients who are having uh, uh, heart surgery are not anxious. A a a and so uh, for the whole sample to reduce the level of anxiety, it, it, it just wouldn't work. A and so we began to think that um, if we're going to do uh, studies of interventions uh, that we actually need to stratify the patients before we do the intervention between a sample that's distressed and a sample that's not distressed. Um, and, and so that was uh, an additional component of our thinking uh, uh, about research about chaplaincy care uh, uh, that really kind of goes back again uh, to the findings about um, um, religious and spiritual struggle, religious distress, that it could help us identify um, patients who are most likely to benefit from chaplaincy care and that if we don't do that stratification, we'll have exactly uh, the outcome that Paul had I is that you won't find any significant effects for the sample as a whole. <coughs> In addition to the important work that, um, uh, uh, the important impact uh, of the work on religious coping on chaplaincy care, um, Daniel Grossman in particular has, has been uh, a, a chaplain who's picked up the important work that Ken uh, and his colleagues have done on sanctification and, and begun to think about what's the impact of beliefs about uh, the sacredness of the body on uh, um, the way in which patients take care of their bodies or uh, particularly in Daniel's context uh, in pediatrics, the way in which parents help take care of children with uh, chronic diseases. Um, and, and so uh, these are data from um, uh, D Daniel's work with um, the parents of children with cystic fibrosis in which he's examining the issue of adherence uh, to recommended um, uh, uh, therapies uh, for the children. And you'll see actually an association that uh, the low adherence parents actually have higher levels of negative religious coping um, and the high adherence or the average adherence parents actually had higher levels of um, sanctification beliefs. The super adherent parents are kind of a strange group, and so the pattern doesn't occur across the whole group, uh, but um, mostly wanted you to see this as an example uh, of the kind of research that chaplains are beginning to do that's again building on some of the important concepts uh, that were developed by Ken and his colleagues. So where do we go? Uh, that, that, so, so, you know, that, so that's a kind of 10 minute um, overview of the research uh, that uh, we've been developing in chaplaincy that really, I would argue, um, uh, and I think actually the other chaplain researchers that I've talked to um, in preparation for this would, would agree actually that the, the advances in chaplaincy research were um, map almost completely onto our becoming aware of Ken's work about religious coping and making use of that. Uh, in the research that we were developing. But now that we're at this point where we've had some experience doing research for the last 15 years, uh, where are we going to go with chaplaincy related research? And that's a question that's really only just come into view for us um, a as we've begun to, to think about our work. Um, but I've begun to think, given how important the work on religious coping has been to us, that there are probably two ways we need to think about our research. And that is that this kind of basic research that gets done by people like Ken uh, and those of you who are in uh, 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 departments of psychology where you're investigating uh, psychology of religion, spirituality, and particularly its links to coping uh, with illness and other kinds of things, and that you're in some sense doing basic research that then becomes important for us as we think about what does that mean for our work and that 
takes us into the applied research that we need to do. So I think some of this basic research we can share with you, but uh, some of it we're really going to rely on you to kind of provide the leadership for. So chaplains uh, uh, learning how to do research is a bit of a stretch for us, and learning how to do measurement research, probably it's best for us just to trust you to do that good work uh, uh, and be in consultation with you about the kind of measures we need. But, um, uh, um, you know, kind of in, in my training in epidemiology, I realized that if we're going to kind of understand health, we need to understand the natural history of different diseases. And so I began to think, what does it mean to understand the natural history of coping with uh, illness um, and with all the different kinds of health problems, uh, illness and injury that um, uh, patients and, and families uh, bring? And so there's begun to be important research about kind of what are the religious needs and resources of patients and families with different cl clinical conditions. Uh, 20 years ago, we didn't have that kind of research. We do now. Uh, we need more. Um, uh, we look to you to provide some of that, but we can actually join you in that research. And then uh, not only the kind of cross-sectional research, but the longitudinal research. What's the natural trajectory of coping, uh, religious coping with uh, difficult illness? We have a little bit of information about some of that, but a lot more that will be important. We know the natural trajectory, then it gives us a lot more information about who it is who needs our help, who it is is more likely to get stuck. Um, and, and so, and then we need to look at all the natural variations that occur in important subgroups, age, gender, race, faith traditions, and things like that. So building on that applied, uh, building on that basic research then, um, we can do uh, important work to develop evidence-based approaches for screening uh, and spiritual assessment. Most of the approaches for spiritual assessment that we have are not evidence-based. Um, they're kind of, unless you count expert opinion, which is certainly important, but not sufficient. Um, uh, and then uh, all the important research that needs to be done to develop interventions for specific patient uh, and family groups and to test those interventions. Um, so hopefully, uh, as the we have time for conversation, we'll get a little feedback of, about the agenda. And, and this just, uh, um, my particular passion is um, on the screening and assessment, uh, and I think uh, an important body of work that we need to do there. Part of the work that has happened in um, developing the body of research that we've had up till now has helped us realize that uh, to kind of build on that research and to advance it, we need to actually have a group of chaplains who have advanced research literacy. So uh, in part, uh, uh, with, you know, based on the, on, the, on the work that we've done, we began to um, think about what it would take to do that. And uh, my colleague, uh, Wendy Cadge at Brandeis University, and I developed a proposal to the Templeton Foundation, and they very graciously uh, uh, gave us um, uh, some support. Uh, that has enabled us to develop uh, a kind of uh, research literacy initiative. A kind of most uh, um, notable piece is that we're sending 16 uh, chaplains, um, we call them uh, chaplain research fellows, um, uh, to get a master's degree uh, in epidemiology or public health uh, to kind of um, take chaplaincy research to a different level. We're going to integrate um, research literacy training uh, in 70 chaplaincy training programs, and we're going to create online courses um, for um, practicing chaplains who want to develop research literacy. The first cohort of chaplain research fellows was just selected. One of those fellows is here, <laughs> Gila Raji. Um, and uh, the first um, cohort of uh, chaplaincy training programs who are receiving research literacy grants was just selected, and one of the recipients is uh, Isla School of Theology, and Kelly Aurora uh, are here. And we're very pleased uh, and excited uh, about how this is developing. So in addition to the important um, intellectual contributions that Ken and, uh, the work of Ken and his colleagues have made to the development of research in chaplaincy, those of you who know Ken know that um, uh, he's also uh, a person who's very available to pro provide uh, um, mentorship and, and support uh, and, and consultation. And that has been no less true with us than with um, uh, colleagues in, in other areas. All of us who are chaplaincy researchers, myself, uh, Daniel Grossamy, Stephen King, Kate Pitterman, all of us uh, w in some sense would not be where we were if it hadn't been for 
ken's personal encouragement that this strange thing that we would were doing that we didn't know anyone else who was doing and we weren't sure we had the capacity to do uh, ken's encouragement um, you know, led us to think actually it was probably not only worth doing, but possible to do, and if there were ways he could help, he would be glad to do that. Uh, and then, it, you know, as we began to kind of move into formal programs of chaplaincy research, there was a, a, a very important initiative, again, funded by the Templeton Foundation through the Healthcare Chaplaincy Network uh, to advance um, uh, chaplaincy research about spiritual care in palliative care. Uh, Ken was an important part of that faculty. This is actually a photograph from one of the meetings of those team, that team. Uh, and, and again, Ken uh, both provided uh, thoughtful uh, uh, um, input, uh, intellectual input to the development of those protocols, but, but again, kind of personal um, uh, support. Um, and um, that made such an important difference to all of the people who were working on that project. And then when Wendy and I kind of came together and began to think about developing the kind of research literacy initiative, uh, we turned again to Ken for consultation about that. Uh, and again, generous, uh, wise, uh, supportive, and uh, delighted to have Ken as part of the advisory committee uh, for that project as well. So not only has uh, Ken's work uh, and, and, and the work of his colleagues uh, made important intellectual contributions to the development of chaplaincy research, but his uh, uh, personal support has played an important role, as I'm sure many of you have experienced. So in closing, the photograph is the photograph of Anton Boysen, who uh, is considered the founder of modern healthcare chaplaincy in the 1920s. Uh, recovering from his own serious mental illness, he becomes a uh, 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 chaplain at Worcester State Hospital, begins the first chaplaincy training program. And as he begins thinking and writing, he actually begins to think about something that um, uh, is sometimes called empirical theology. And you'll see a quote uh, here from Boysen studying the human personality and health and disease, seeking systematically to discover the motive forces and the machinery involved uh, and to formulate the laws which govern them, we may be able to lay the foundation of a new theology. What is involved is a thoroughgoing shift of attention and then in the end, a new authority grounded not in tradition, but in experience. So I have uh, in the past actually um, uh, said uh, publicly in an article that I think Ken is an empirical theologian. Uh, uh, I think Ken is helping chaplains develop empirical theology. I'd be glad to hear your thoughts about that and thank you for your attention. Thank you.